Welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing creating the best in class provisional applications and how you can leverage it in many ways for all the strategic advantages they have. So today, in this episode, we will cover provisionals, a powerful weapon bringing business value versus what most people would just consider sort of an esoteric process with the patent office. Today we'll cover six topics. The first topic is what is a provisional application? Uh, we'll go a little bit more in depth than just the, the normal stuff, of course, but we'll talk about what that is. And topic number two, we'll talk about the many types of provisionals, and you might be surprised by this. And topic number three, the various strategic uses for provisionals. And we can't cover them all, but we'll give you a snapshot of 10 or 12 of them. And in topic number four, we'll talk about how provisionals can provide very unique leverage. In topic number five, we'll talk about other things to consider using provisionals if you're a medium or large size company. And in topic number six, we'll talk about other things considered using provisionals if you're a small company. And then of course, we'll wrap up. We always talk about the audience. So if you're one of the audience participants who when you're thinking about provisionals, you really don't understand what they are, this is for you. For those folks in small companies who wanna get a lot of leverage out of intellectual property, this is certainly for you. For those in large companies, if you want to expand your innovation practices, this is for you. And this is an important thing for large companies because they don't consider provisionals part of their innovation practice. Also, for those who want to understand the dozens of uses of provisionals, those who want to understand the many types of provisionals available. Basically, for an audience here, for those who might want to leverage their patent counsel, how to maybe save money or work better with patent consoles. And also from an audience perspective, for those who want to leverage things like the R&D practices, the NDA practices, engineering notebooks, and all sorts of related processes. This is John Cronin, Invent Anything. Coming up, you'll learn a lot about provisionals related to bringing the value to your business. And most of all, get educated and know how many different types of provisionals there are. Inventions keep the world spinning. From fire in the wheel to today's high tech, inventions power change. Turn your inventions into reality. Learn how to get your ideas to market. This is Invent Anything with John Cronin. So let's dig in. Topic number one, what is a provisional? Well, in the dry sense, a provisional application provides a, a filed application with the patent office, which is really a filing date. And the idea is to have the provisional start at the date of filing where the provisional needs to be converted to a patent within one year of the time frame when it's filed as a provisional. But a second point, a provisional patent application reserves this filing date for that time of the idea and it will meet all the requirements of the USPTO. But thirdly, and very interestingly, provisionals are not examined by the, uh, by the patent examiners and they do expire after a year. A filed patent application can use the priority date of the provisional, meaning that when a patent is filed within one year of the provisional, it can use the date of that provisional. And as long as the provisional application contains enough technical specification to cover the claims of the patent application, then the priority date of the patent application will be the provisional application. So that's great news. One of the great things about provisionals is they're cheap. $300 for a company, $150 for a small entity, and even $75 for a micro entity. What is a small entity? These are really small business concerns of 500 employees or less. Could be universities, could be nonprofits. And if you're one of those and also have greater than four patents uh, filed, you can apply for a micro entity for $75. One of the great things about provisionals is that you can use it patent pending. This is so cool for your marketing campaigns to file a provisional and just be able to say patent pending. Provisional could have five or 10 pages in it but, and submit it for low cost. And now you can say patent pending. That's super. One of the nice things about a provisional is you don't need a lawyer to file it. The fee is just a filing fee if you want to write it up. Um, one of the things though, since there's no requirement for who's writing it up, uh, you have to be aware because if you just write up something and we'll talk about this, that won't do anything for a patent application down the road, then why bother? One of the things about a provisional application is it's cheap to obtain. And if you have the level of quality in it that a professional might give, it can be very powerful for obtaining a patent. 
And finally, one of the cool things about a provisional is it stays hidden until the patent uh, is opened up and, and, and allowed. That what this means is that uh, someone can see your provisional uh, if your patent, you know, after 18 months is in the patent office. So if you file a patent on the provisional, then 18 months later, the patent lays open. When the patent files and issues, the provisional will lay open. But you don't have to do that uh, until the patent gets issued. And we'll talk about the reasons why you might want to keep provisionals kind of secret for as long as possible. Well, let's jump into topic number two, the many types of provisionals. Now, I've been working in my firm for 25 years, filing provisionals. I've done this for years before that when I was at IBM. I've seen many things when it comes to provisional filings. I've seen it from many different companies. We've worked with 1,500 companies. I've seen many different patent attorneys. who work with hundreds and thousands of those different firms. So we've seen a lot of different types of provisionals. So as a person that has this kind of experience, I can say that there are many types. Why don't we share some? First of all, I'm gonna give these kind of labels. These labels are not in the patent office. These are just labels I'm giving them. So you can differentiate. So one type of provisional is the do-it-yourself provisional. It's really not recommended. I mean, what you might do is just file something, figure out how to fill it out on the patent office form, submit the form, pay your fees, and you're done. But that may be a total waste of time and money, unless, of course, you're using the patent pending thing, because there's certain things you have to have in the provisional so that it can be used to secure the date of the patent filing, which is the whole point of provisionals. So to do it yourself, you have to be very concerned if you do that, that you might not have enough information in the provisional to get a patent. There's a provisional I call the thesis. We've seen a lot of these. What happens is that some company, small company or independent inventor will create 50, 100, 200 pages, really a thesis of information, hoping that when they file that as a provisional, that that will be a whole substance body of knowledge that you can use to file the patent later on. The problem is a lot of those body of knowledge that you might put in might not suffice for the enablement needed for the patent application. But of course, we can see that. But we did talk about enablement in episode six. So maybe if you go to episode six and listen to that, then that would help you to figure out even in a large body document like a thesis, how it will work. A lot of companies we see filing what I'll call the two-page concept or invention disclosure. A lot of companies, small and big, have an invention disclosure, which is just a couple of pages. What's the problem? What's your solution? You know, what do you think the novelty is? What do you know about the prior art? And then you file that as a provisional. Many times this two-page concept file as a provisional still will not have enough specification in it to suffice as a good background for the patent application. So you need to be careful. One of the things that we do is to make the provisional look like a patent. And I think this is kind of best process. And this is kind of what we do. Um, it's a process that does cost money because you bring it in a professional, certainly less than a patent. And in it, you have great figures, great diagrams, title, abstract, all sorts of information about the specification and at least one claim. It's more expensive, but you now can rely on the provisional as looking like a patent. You don't have to pay the patent fees, but a provisional fee. Uh, so you're saving a fair amount of money to file the provisional, but the provisional is right. So you can always rely on it being converted to a patent. Another type of provision we've seen, I call the file drawer. And basically what happens is that somebody's taking all the related documents that they can find for business, for marketing, from technical notebooks, and they're smashing it all together and sending it into the patent office for provisional application. Problem with this is at the end of the day, the provisional gets laid open if you wanna maintain the date of the provisional as being the date of the patent. And if that lays open, this file draw lays open, you may be over teaching and divulging so much more information than you ever hoped to have done. Things like cost estimates or marketing campaigns from the file drawer. So be very careful with this sort of file drawer mentality. Now, there is a type of provision we've seen, which is kind of interesting. It's called, I'll give it the name, the copy. So what happens is you end up copying lots of information from the internet. You get on Wikipedia and you start getting on websites and extracting information and putting it in a massive Word document, hoping that all this information gathering will allow you to have huge flexibility in the patent that you file from the provisional. Well, again, one of the problems is this, is that this could backfire. You could literally be creating prior art for yourself by showing all this information and connecting it. So we certainly would not recommend this sort of copy provisional mentality. One of the things that we've seen which works excellent 
is using the provisional as a first to file document. In, in 2013, the American Event Act changed from first to invent in the United States to first to file. And what that means, it's a race to the patent office. So if you're using provisional documents in such a way to get speed to the patent office, that type of provisional is, is really well-sounded and highly recommended. A couple more. One of the types of provisionals we've seen is a very solid spec specification with one claim, which I mentioned before, which is our practice. But this actually really looks like a patent document. The only thing left is more claims. And of course, this would be highly recommended as well. So both the, having a solid specification with at least one claim is very important, but you could file a patent application as a provisional. It's not a patent. You won't pay the $6,000 fee. It looks just like a patent. You file it as a provisional, and at any point in time, you can click a button, pay the fee, and move it on as a patent. Now, there you're paying a lot more money for the provisional filing, but you're absolutely ready on that date that you want to send it to the patent office. You don't have to go through a patent attorney a second time. Finally, the last type of provisional I'd like to talk about is called the prior art. This is a really almost sneaky thing to do. Basically, it's recognizing that the provisional is going to be information that when laid open, examiners will be forced to look at it, meaning that they'll search their own patent office and look at this provisional as prior art to another patent. So you could file a provisional with lots of information and lay it open immediately so that examiners have to look at it. So what's happening is you're supplying prior art directly to the examiner. And why would you do that? We've talked about this before in a number of the sessions, that prior art could stop somebody else from getting a patent. And that's a wonderful strategy for you. So come up, coming up, believe it or not, there are dozens of strategic uses for provisionals and for small companies, provisionals could be a lifesaver. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. So let's move on to topic number three, strategic uses for provisional. And again, I've provided some sort of labels as a way to talk about this as basic uses and things like that. So the first sort of strategic use of provisionals I'll call the basics. And the basics is this is the cheapest way to secure the date of an invention and to set yourself up for patent applications. So provisionals are a great way to set yourself up without going directly to the patent application. There is a sort of overall um, strategic use of provisional, which I'll call provisional loading for M&A or investors. And what this means is, say a month or two or three or four months before you're gonna be raising money or being acquired, you look at your portfolio areas strategically and maybe you file half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen provisionals and get them on record. Now you can be able to say that you have 12 or 13 or 15, you know, provisional applications filed. And part of the raise could be that they'll pay for the patent applications. What a great way of inst instantly creating value for your company to put on the books. You have 10, 12, 15 provisionals. We do an awful lot of this kind of work. Early stage companies and even companies that are large want to get a real position very quickly. And one way to do it is to get these provisionals. But again, these provisionals have to be well enabled. And, we'll and we talked about that in episode number six. Another thing is using provisionals for the topic of protecting yourself in an M&A situation or in an NDA situation. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, you get an NDA with a company and the first thing you wanna do with that NDA is to make sure that it's gonna protect you. But a great thing to do is before you get in place with an NDA, if there's something very special that you think you're gonna do, then you might wanna file a provisional or two on it. That's a better protection than an NDA. So getting provisionals in plus the NDA is the strongest suit you can apply for. Another thing is we may meet a lot of companies where they're small and they're being acquired or someone's looking at them to be acquired. A larger company will come in and investigate through the diligence process. There's a high level of interest. Everyone's excited. Maybe there's a lot of money involved. But a lot of M&A sort of diligences sort of evaporate. The large company decides for some reason that it doesn't want to acquire. And later on, some of these large companies appear to have the technology that you have. And then there's always this kind of remorse that maybe you gave away too much information. So if you're going to be sort of assessed for an M&A, you should run to, and try to get as many provisionals filed as possible for the M&A. Because if you do that, if someone investigates you in a diligence, 
They can't just walk away and start copying you. As a matter of fact, in the MA of diligence, you'll show that you have 15 whatever provisionals, and that'll get them concerned. But they'll have to be highlighted to know that they can't basically take the technology if they decide not to buy you. Another thing, and this is a great use for provisionals, it's sort of getting a quick position. What do we mean by getting a quick position? You might be worried that you're divulging some information to somebody. And it could even be you divulge it under NDA or you divulge it at some sort of meeting. Well, it's very interesting. In the United States, you can actually divulge to the public something, an invention, and you have up to one year to file a provisional to cover that invention and to meet the requirements of having the ability to own a patent. You lose the rights in the rest of the world, but at least if you divulge something kind of because it was a mistake, or because all of a sudden you divulge something and all of a sudden the other side said, this is really important, I'm gonna go do this. And all of a sudden, what do you do? How do you fight? You file a provisional. So getting a quick position is really important. Another aspect of provisionals is I'll call it value chain provisionals. Your value chain is things like your suppliers and things like your customers, correct? Partners, et cetera, all the ecosystem around you. A lot of times when you're talking about what you're doing, how your technology works and how the product works, what you'll find out is others will start to have insights that maybe they can improve on the supply to you and they'll get inventions there. Or the customer may say, if I get this from you, maybe I can improve it and get patents there. So what you can do is file provisionals in the supply side or on the customer side. So what you're doing is you're covering someone from copying or improving your idea on either side of the value chain. This is really tremendous when you're using and filing provisionals like this, and later on maybe converting to patents, because you can leverage it in the discussions with, with the suppliers about the cost of their supplies because you own the IP, or with the customers that you own the way they're going to use the inventions and therefore they have to use you. One of my favorite tricks in provisional is called the, the rolling provisionals rolling provisionals. So we mentioned this year filing date. Well, the year filing date, you know, maybe you're coming up to the 10th or 11th month. Maybe the market hasn't changed that much, but you don't want to really spend the seven or eight or $10,000 more to convert that provisional to a patent, but you don't want to lose your date. So what do you do? You can take that same provisional and refile it as a new provisional. Now, what will happen is over the next month or two, you still have the date of the first provisional. But once you cross that date of the first provisional, you have now moved the date of the earliest filing to the second provisional. But this rolling provisional effect is very useful because it's not an either or thing. It turns out that there might not be prior art and there might, may not be uh, interest in the technology even within that year or two or three. So we've seen provisionals roll for one, two, three, four years. As long as the technology is not known, this is a very effective strategy. One of the interesting things about provisionals in, is another technique called the twin provisional, the twin. Well, these aren't exactly twins. I mean, there are twins that are identical twins and there are twins that are just born at the same time, but they're not identical. So these are kind of twins born at the same time, they're not identical. What do we mean by this? So I'll just give you one example, there's many, but imagine filing two provisionals, separate documents at the same date. One provisional is very short, very succinct and surrounds exactly what your invention is. The second provisional is a copy of the first provisional, but a whole bunch more subject matter that you could do for continuations. Why would you do that? Because now at some point, you are going to file a patent application and point to the provisional uh, that references the date. Is it gonna be the short provisional or the really embellished provisional? Well, if you suspect that you don't wanna to teach too much because you've now waited a year, you might do the short provisional. On the other hand, if you've seen the technology really emerge and you wanna get lots of continuations, you might decide to file the provisional, provisional that's packed. So there's ways to doing this and combinations of these things, the digital, I mean, the, the, the twin provisional or the rolling provisional, use them together uh, as sort of a hybrid. We mentioned, of course, another use for provisionals, the patent pending play. So once the provisional is filed, you get to use the patent uh, pending. Boy, think about it. In a competition where things are fast and you have competitors, you could literally see what they do. File a provisional, get a patent pending, and put that on your website. Now your competitor doesn't know what to do because you get a patent pending on their product. Now, again, if a provisional is ever going to be used, it'll be based on the filing date. If it's going to be converted to the patent, you're going to find a, sign an oath of declaration for the patent 
meaning that you're going to have to divulge what prior art you knew at the time you filed the patent or the time you filed the provisional because that's the date you're relying on. And you may have to talk about that competitive product as being prior art. So there's really no free lunch. And the last one I'll mention here is provisional bet hedging. Provisional bet hedging. Really, you're creating a bet in your business using provisionals. And there are many ways you might want to place a bet. So maybe you have a new idea of a new technology direction. Maybe one of the business issues is you need a race to get ownership. Maybe it's going to be a good direction, maybe not. So you start filing provisionals because they're cheap. They're a couple, two or $300 and maybe five or $6,000 to create a really good one, whatever, whatever it is. And now you can use this as a business tool. You can hedge the direction of various technology. Maybe you have four choices of technology. You're going to pick one. All provisionals on all four, hedging your bet. So topic number four, how provisionals can provide very unique leverage. One of the ways that provisionals can provide very unique leverage is on deciding on when or not to use trade secrets. You see, you could file a provisional with a lot of information in it. It could become a patent or you might want to keep it secret. So you get to decide that within the year. So if you have something that you think is kind of trade secret, but you're not quite sure, you file it as a provisional. And if you really, at the end of the day, say this is your trade secret, you just don't file it as a provisional. What a wonderful way for a small amount of money to actually give you maximum leverage for your IP strategy. Here's one. I call it the employee lockup. You know, being a CEO of four or five companies in my life and dealing with CEOs all the time, eventually there could be all sorts of problems with employees. Empl employees that claim that, you know, they own something uh, and really they, they may or may not. So by av having them create a provisional with their name on it to file for you will actually surface whether or not there's going to be a problem because you think you own it and they don't think that you own it. You ask them to file a provisional, you'll actually really figure out whether they think they own it or not. Another thing about a provisional is you could quote own the art. See, you could file dozens of provisionals cheaply. Then later on, file some patents. You could file a patent on three provisionals concatenated together. That's really cool. You could file another patent with two or three different provisionals concatenated together. So as I mentioned, one of the new areas that we could talk about is aggregating a bunch of provisionals together to create various types of patent applications. This is a really powerful strategy. What we mean here is that you could file, say, 10 provisionals as an example. Nine months, 10 months go by, you decide you're going to take provisional one, four, five, combine them together, and that will be the basis of a patent. Maybe you take provisional two and six and eight, combine those and file those as a new patent application. What's really neat is you create provisionals on these little pieces and you can aggregate them together for very unique combinations. This is a very powerful strategy to give you a maximum patent strategy, giving you a year to figure out when you want to patent and what. One of the things is that you can use provisionals as enabled publications, meaning you just create a, a provisional and figure out a way to really enable it well and lay it open. Now the examiners are going to use it as prior art. One of the key uses, our provisionals, and we see a lot of this, we strongly recommend this, is before there's a key meeting, and the word is before there's a key meeting that's technical, you file a provisional. Because if you go into the meeting and then both sides are discussing something, you know, say you and a, you and a various partner, if they say they own it, you can easily dispute it because you filed the provisional before you had the meeting. One of the things about provisionals is, and, and this is something we haven't seen a lot of, but it's been kind of my dream of uh, working with companies is they treat provisionals almost as an engineering notebook. Since provisionals are so inexpensive, maybe every six months, engineers who have notebooks, they could take you know, groups of 10 or 15 or 20 pages and file them as a provisional, as long as they're enabled. What this does is gives you a, an engineering notebook that at any point in time could be converted to assets that you own. And that's tremendous. We have, because we do a lot of monetization of patents found out, that if you want to sell or license a patent, it's great to kind of, before we do that work, is to quickly build a half a dozen provisionals surrounding the improvements and the event on tops and event arounds. So now you're selling that one asset plus six more pro provisionals. It's cheap and it's a powerful way to raise the value through monetization. We mentioned how provisionals can be used by your marketing team, but if we think about it, you can actually enhance your marketing campaign 
If you look at your marketing campaign, and you want to beef it up. Maybe you can follow some provisionals in certain areas so you can have patent pending and claim that you're the innovator. And finally, this is a race to the patent office. It's a first to file world. So it's really important that you look at provisionals as one of the unique competitive weapons to own the market before anybody else by racing to the patent office. So coming up, we're going to learn some best practices of how many medium and large size companies might be able to leverage provisionals and even how uh, we can leverage your legal team to help you save some money. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. Topic number five, other things to consider using provisionals. And this topic covers if you're a medium or large company. So one of the things is that if you're a public company, maybe you can use provisional filings as a way to enhance the stock value. We've seen this. Public markets respond to changes in asset values of companies. So maybe you could file some provisionals on a key new technology, a buzzword, if you will, quantum computing used for something or NFTs used for something. And you file those provisionals because they're a matter of record. You put the title out there. They don't exactly know what it is but then the street actually sees that you're innovative. One of the things to do that we've seen with large companies and medium-sized companies is using provisionals and then laying them open for, for freedom to operate. What this means is that if something gets out in the prior art, then nobody else can get a patent on it. So this is a wonderful way of getting a freedom to operate of a particular product where you file the provisional and lay it open. When I was at IBM, we had the IBM Technical Disclosure Bulletin in our inventions that we wanted to publish were laid open with an IBM technical disclosure bulletin. Well, most companies don't have a technical bulletin that's read worldwide like IBM did. So provisionals are a great way to have free to operate. Look, a lot of companies that I work with at a large might have a very bunch of different innovation processes. One of them is well known as StageGate with Coopers and Egbert. We have all various stages of product production and innovation. One of the nice things is to various gates of the stage gate, you could file provisionals as one of the key items in order to ensure you went through that gate correctly. What better way to figure out what are the most important assets you have, file them as provisionals as a hard directive of a stage gate. A lot of companies have R&D projects going on all the time. A great thing to do is if you've got an R&D project is call some sort of milestone out, say three months from now, when something gets done and say at this milestone, we're gonna review the project and we're gonna file the key provis provisionals. What a wonderful way of sort of adding good IP, simple-minded strategy to your R&D. And the same is true of brainstorming. When you do a brainstorming pro process and you basically come up with ideas, it'd be great to list the ideas, it'd be great to pick the top five. It'd be great for someone to say, look, we want to make sure these brainstorming sessions are important. So at least let's file the top two or three ideas we have as provisionals. This way, what you're doing is making the brainstorming session creating assets. So the brainstorming session becomes even more valuable. One of the things we've seen with a lot of large and medium-sized companies is the patent council is under a tremendous workload. So one of the things we do to help them is to file provisionals, giving them some optionality, give them another year to determine whether they want to file a patent or not. Now, they should know that they can file provisionals and patents just like us. But a lot of times, filing provisionals could actually come from you know, R&D and technical management versus the uh, patent attorneys group. And so patent attorneys working with the technical or business people can create a provisionals process that might help with the workload. We mentioned before the NDA issue and how important NDAs are to companies, but one of the things that large and medium-sized companies could do to improve their position, because all, all these NDAs just end up in electronic file cabinets and, and they're really not relevant until you actually need them for something very important. But if you get in the habit of filing provisionals in front of key topics or key meetings or key relationships, then you have a secondary way and a more specific way to manage your confidential information. I'm a consultant, lots of companies hire consultants. One thing you could do if you hire consultants is to try to figure out a way if they, you think they have inventions is to ask them to file provisionals that you'll pay for, for them. Because you have a work for hire, this is one way to make sure that you have the inventions they created for you on, on your nickel. One of the key things I mentioned employees, but nothing is better than if you have an exit interview with a client, or, I mean, of a, with an employee, you could ask that employee to file the 
provisionals, uh, you know, catching up their work before they leave. So they have two to three weeks where they're trying to, you know, move out anyway, asking to write some provisionals up of what they're doing. That's a great way of capturing what they own right before they leave. One of the last areas I'll mention for large companies, middle-sized companies is capturing the white space with provisionals. A lot of companies kind of do roadmaps and marketing and patent analytics and technology scouting and all sorts of stuff. Where from these studies, they talk about white spaces, areas that are truly areas for innovation. Maybe six months from now, that report is gone and you forgot what the white space was. It'd be great to tack on to any kind of white space analysis that the result of it will be to make sure that in some of the white spaces, we run a brainstorming session or two and then file some provisionals. See, in these cases, what we're doing is we're using provisionals as just a business tool or, or, or sort of innovation tool, if you will, in order to make the results of the innovation to be more robust. Boy, I'll tell you, if something really important comes up and you had filed a provisional and that turns out to a really important patent, you'll look like an absolute hero for doing it. Cost is cheap, not a lot of time, uh, so why not do it? Let's move to topic number six, the final topic. These are other things to consider using provisionals like before, but now you're a small company. And like I said earlier, some of this stuff could actually save your company if you're an early stage company. One of the key things you can do is get good at filing provisionals and you can really hedge your bet that you could own this and you're saving the cost of a patent attorney until you really need them. So maybe you file 10 provisionals, but later on you only file two patents. Instead of having a patent attorney involved in all 10 of them, you just involve them in the two. But this means that you'll learn how to write up a good provisional once you go, I'll go back to episode six, which teaches about enablement, because that has to be in the provisional. One of the other things about provisionals, which are also very neat, is when you do hire a patent attorney, if you're a small company, and you want to produce a, a patent application, go through the exercise of creating a provisional. And by sending the provisional to the attorney, instead of him starting from ground zero, he's starting from a good write-up. And so whatever his fees are going to be, you could probably knock them down by half because you spent the time writing the provisionals. This is not rocket science. There's a formula on how to write this. Once again, episode six should tell you how to do this from an enabling standpoint. If you're an early stage company, one of the cheapest things you can do to start an IP program is to start filing provisionals. And we highly recommend this. One of the things if you're an early stage company is you have a business plan, business market product technology, you can just look at those charts and figure out where you might have inventions that you want to apply for provisionals and then lace your business plan with provisional filings to make you look like a truly sophisticated IP startup company. One of the things that I've seen quite a lot is founders working together. It's all exciting when you start the company together, however you do that. My hat's off to founders to actually have the guts to go do this. But supposing you're a founder and there's two or three other founders. And then supposing, like lots of happens, there may be some new revenues, some new investments, and things are starting to move on with the company. There always becomes a battle to ask the question, well, who really was the founder? Who really created this? This becomes a whole bunch of negative discussions, in my opinion. However, if you decide to start a company and you really are the founder, if you file some provisionals first before you discuss what you want to do with other founders, you will really be the founder. A lot of times, you know, early stage companies will have angel investors or other types of investors for invest investment. And if raising money is difficult for you, you might consider filing some provisionals because now you've got some assets that they can always rely on if the investment doesn't go the direction. So for early stage companies, there are various stages of your company. You know, you hire two people, you hire four people, your revenue is 1 million, your revenue is 2 million. So you're growing. You should get in the habit of filing provisionals at various stages because there's always new innovations tripping through these various stages. So get into that habit. And therefore you can you know, always have a very good IP strategy. I've been on a lot of boards myself, chairman of a number of boards, both public and private. And I can tell you, board members like to have exciting news. There's always lots of problems to solve, but it'd be great to have some exciting news. So one of the great things you can do as a CEO or a CFO, we're about to have some, a board meeting, is to file some provisionals about the new stuff again, because it's so cost effective. And it shows by documentation that you actually think you own this stuff. If you as an early stage company is gonna have a significant business meeting with a customer or investor, you might wanna be filing some provisionals before that meeting to bolster up your position, to embellish that you're an innovator. 
And here's the last one I'll give you from the perspective of an early stage company of how provisionals can be important to you. We've seen a number of situations where investors and the company are not seeing eye to eye. The investor wants to wind down their interest, pull the funding, or they want to exit. Maybe there's two investors and one wants to exit. Maybe some investors actually think that whatever happened in the company was incorrect. There could be some investors that may be so negative that they could be threatening to sue you. There's a lot of stuff happens in business. One of the great things about provisionals is that if you have a negative investor, you could file some provisionals and basically provide that as an asset and use it as a trading card. Say, look, we'll give you the inventions up to this point. You take your, the rest of your money, don't sue us, whatever, and you'll have the provisionals. That means that you can convert them to patents and you can own this technology. Why would you do that? Well, it's as long as you give us a license back if you ever file the patents. But why would you do that? Because there's always going to be more invention. There's always going to be improvements and you can get new provisionals and new patents in the future. But it's a great way to kind of exit a negative inventor, a ne negative investor. Well, let's wrap up. In the first topic, we talked about what a provisional application is. If you recall, it was all about the filing date. For us to file, you don't need examiners. Cost is low. Being able to use patent pending. A lot of uses about a patent application and what it is. In topic number two, we talked about uh, the and discussed the many unique types of provisionals, like the thesis, like the file draw, like the prior art, or the, the person that copies Wikipedia and puffs it up. But we hope that each of those ones that we talked about, that if you go back to the most important thing, the provisionals need to be enabled. Who cares how you get the information in? So that uh, episode six in enablement would be a pretty big one for you. We talked about in topic number three, strategic uses for provisionals. We discuss many different uses from the basics, assisting with NDAs or M&As, leveraging the sale of patents, rolling provisionals, the twin, provisional bet hedging, a lot of different ways to use strategic uses for provisionals. In topic number four, we talked about how provisionals can provide very unique leverage. This is pretty important. They talked about how you can leverage and hedge things like trade secrets, how you can control employees, how this might be the greatest thing to figure out how to pick and choose you know, further filings. In topic number four, we talked about how provisionals can provide very unique leverage. We discussed all sorts of things from hedging or tr hedging trade secrets, employee control, how you can use them as prior art, how you can leverage multiple provisionals at one point in time and pick and choose various ones to file patents. We discussed all sorts of ideas, like literally how to use provisionals as a engineering notebook, a very strong engineering notebook. In topic number five, we talked about how large companies and medium-sized companies might be able to find other uses for provisionals. We talked about how we could leverage their innovation practices, how microcaps or public companies, but generally smaller companies, could use it in their stock, you know, raise the value of the stock possibly, using it for free to operate. We talked about using it for R&D processes like StageGate, or even using it to fill employee em, 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 employees with exit interviews to figure out how to make sure you know what you own before they leave, or even how you can use this in white space analysis, or using it as a very strong practice for brainstorming as a way of sort of tallying up what the inventions are for the brainstorming and R&D. So large companies and medium-sized companies can have a lot of unique uses for provisionals. And finally, we talked about small companies. You know, what is the uses for small companies? There are many th things here in dealing with patent councils, ways to save money, ways to start your own IP program, way to handle founders, ways that you can use it to even handle unsatisfied investors. There's so many different uses for provisionals for early stage and small companies. Well, if you like what you hear uh, today, please subscribe. And if you like, come join us and invent anything. And also maybe take a look at our Inventors at Work where we interview inventors about their work. Thanks very much.